All right. Oh, okay. All right. Woody Barry. Okay. All right. Cool. 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 What's going on, everybody? We are inside of 24 hours. Hopefully. 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 So what do you said from the Bay Area? Dude, that's strange because we I, I have cousins that moved to San Diego before I was born. And my family, like Dude, if you if you move away, you go off the reservation like that, people get mad. It's dude, it's so that's funny, dude. It's the same thing. Now I try to keep up with those cousins too, but yeah. Hey, ever thought of changing your first name to Epic? Epic Johnson? No, no, I'm good. Uh, no, 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 oh, oh, you stupid melon farmers, no, no, turn the frick back around, oh, no, ah, 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 what the f- The infighting is absurd. Yep. Yep, Woody, that reads. That's the load spreader. So this thing right here is the load spreader for the hot staging ring. Damn it. Why is that heading back towards the pad? Uh-oh. Uh oh. That could potentially mean that there's a uh, destacking. Ah, Kelv, you shite. The 11,000 is going up as well. Frick. This is coming from our buddies over at NSF. Oh, man. Maybe they have other hot staging rings at the pad they need to move. <sighs> I don't know, man. Maybe. I Dude, if it doesn't go tomorrow, I really can't... I can't cover it. But it might be a last-minute stack. They're not going to do much crazy integration work on Starship because they have the flight termination system installed. Flight termination systems in the past, you basically is the bottleneck. You plan around everything. Why? Because the flight termination system usually is a gigantic explosive that's strapped to the side of your rocket. Once upon a time... It's story time. Space story time. Ready? 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 Once upon a time, they built the Saturn V. Okay? This thing. NASA, NASA and contractors made this thing. And then they realized, you know, there's some other stuff that they have to do before they put the flight termination system on. But that all happens at the pad. There's some stuff at the pad that, that you have to do for integration, right? For integration. You have to do it for integration. Uh, so that stuff that they had to do at the pad basically meant that they couldn't put the flight termination system on, you know, before it left the VAB, the building that it was assembled in, the vehicle assembly building. So, so, so they built, uh, here, give me a second. Discovery, go at throttle up. Picture, picture, picture. Picture. Ah, here we go. Nice picture. So, in order to get around that, you know, roll to the pad, do the integration on the pad, and then put the flight termination system in after it's rolled to the pad, they built that thing. Yeah. Hey, Render. Thanks for that Prime sub. I appreciate it. Yep. So, okay. What's the point that I'm trying to make? So, okay, that thing was carried by the crawler transporters, and it's basically built like a mobile launcher, like this thing. But it's obviously just all open. It's an open frame and a big truss system. What this thing is is a gigantic elevator. So you can go... It's an elevator that moves like a three- or four-story building up and down on its tracks. And the reason why they did that is so, you know, if you look at this, this kind of clamps around the rocket so you have a clean space to work, right? This basically can move up and down on this thing, and you can install the flight termination system on the vehicle. 
basically meaning that flight termination systems preclude any other work. You do not work on a rocket where there are bombs strapped to the side. So, in order to roll the vehicle out, or in order to roll the Saturn V out to do the additional work that needed to be done on the pad to make sure everything was working, but, you know, which precluded installing the flight termination system, NASA made that thing. So, what I'm trying to tell you is, is that they're not going, like, they might de-stack, but they're not going to do, it's not, they're not going to do a lot of work. Unless this de-stack, unless they go to de-stack and they take the flight termination system off, whatever they're doing is, it's either going to be something quick or they're just moving something around. That's what I'm trying to say. Does that make sense, dudes? Shape charges, not bombs. Yeah, yeah, hyperbole is a thing that is often lost on people on the internet, Deadbringer. You in Florida all next week? Yes. After tomorrow, I'm going to be gone for a week. Um, as always, the insane anxiety that you get right before you go on vacation when you're a streamer and don't have any guaranteed income is uh, palpable, especially with the Starship launch. That's not helping. Yep. So, you know, it's just good, but, you know, like they embrace the suck. It's fine. It's fine. Hey, Antares. So, yeah, once again, fellas, I'm going to be gone all next week. I will be back on Monday, the 27th. I hate taking... Dude, even now, 10 years in, taking vacation bothers the heck out of me. There's no guarantees in this business. There's no, gar There's no guarantees that anyone's going to be here when I get back. But I, I know I know you guys will. But also I don't know, man. I don't like it. I don't like it. Watch VODs for a week, yep. You're only possibly missing one of the biggest events in the history of space travel. Nah, don't worry. They're gonna launch another one during Christmas. Oops. No, the, there's already paperwork for Flight 3, guys. That's what I've been... Th that stuff that I've been hearing, there's already paperwork being filed with the FCC for the third Starship flight. And if I'm understanding this correctly and looking at the dates for it, we might see another Starship launch at the end of December. Yep. You need multiple streams of income. Who says I don't have that, NZP? No, that's a that's a really dip, bad way of looking at it. Um, oh, I'm going to stream tomorrow, Latte. I'll be here. I'm leaving on Saturday, so we are all good. <laughs> Discovery, go at throttle up. Hayes, don't. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Thanks for the ten subs, dudes. But yeah, and Massive Pigs with a prime sub. So yeah, just, uh, I'm not, <laughs> I appreciate the subs and everything, dudes, but here, worry a little less. No, uh, we've, pad Cities has been padding it pretty well, Hayes. I do appreciate the support. A and Pigs as well. Thank you. Thank you for clicking the prime button. Thank you. It, it means a lot. Um, yeah, guys, don't, don't get me wrong. This isn't me being like, oh my God, I, I'm more than comfortable to be 100% honest with you. Uh, but that's the thing. I'm never, it's, it's, it's never, with streaming, it's never enough. It's never going to be enough. I could have like three times the subs that I have right now. And I'd still be like, Ugh. so don't, don't take that as me going, well, you, well, you, you best be damn supporting me when I'm at my lowest being on vacation. Wait, no, no, don't, don't take it like that. That's not what I mean. It's just, it's better if I get it out there and just get it off my chest. You know what I mean? Alex was 100% sure they couldn't be ready by the end of the year. Guess February for IFT3. I mean, even February, dude. That's pretty crazy considering. Maybe you should take that more literally. Consider simulcasting. I'm working on simulcasting, Sinerd, but uh, uh, there is another project that I can't tell you about or that I don't want to tell you about. I can tell you about it. There's another project that I'm working on that is taking up a little bit of uh, spare time. I always, and this goes back to what NZP was saying, you should always diversify with content creation, and I'm working on other things. I'm working on other stuff, which... Uh, this other project that I'm working on is a very long-term project, so, well, I don't want to say anything. I don't, I don't know about you guys, I don't, 
whenever I have a project that's not work related, right? And it's something that I'm completely doing out of my spare time, right? I never tell anybody about it. Like I didn't tell anybody about run route 154 until I was sure it was going to happen. Like a hundred percent sure. I didn't tell you guys about it. Uh, I don't like telling people like, oh yeah, I'm working on this. Oh yeah, I'm working on this big project. This is going to be amazing. I don't like doing that if there is uncertainty that it's not going to happen. Because for whatever reason, when I tell somebody about it, I notice the correlation in habits. Whenever I tell someone about it, it never gets done. I don't know. I don't know about, I don't know if you guys are the same way, but <laughs> say it with me. Patriot bodegas. Yes, very good. Now you just need some good sponsors and a robust merch line. You rob yourself of the joint motivation if you tell people it's... Yeah, Nate, for sure. For sure. Yeah, I have a bad habit of starting projects I don't finish. You? No. Bodegas. EJ went to Europe without telling us. I couldn't tell you about that, to be fair. I couldn't say anything. I, I, had, to, I had to come up with some bum story. And you know what? You know what the messed up part is? It really felt wrong lying. I didn't like that at all. Like, I had an ethical conundrum there. I was like, Ugh. I didn't like it. I don't like, no, I don't like lying. lying. Lying doesn't make you feel good. Damn tegrity! Yeah. Because lying paves the way to sociopathic behavior. At least with me. I'm not doing that. that that's 20-year-old EJ, not 35-year-old EJ, you know? In hindsight, you, you gave a big clue when you said you had to get your passport updated. Well, call it, call it Pavlovian guilt, I guess, you know. Are we ready? I'm ready, Zizep. Yeah. Ray Parker Jr. would say, Busted makes you feel good. You had insider knowledge. So what do you think they're going to do with Starship if they're going to destack? Probably some last minute stuff, to be honest with you. Ken Squire died. Yeah, I heard about that. Mm -hmm. Human brains specifically, the reward circuits, can't tell, can't tell the difference between doing a thing and saying you're going to do a thing. So that makes sense. Yeah, no, I don't tell people about what I'm working on. I just go and do it. And then when I have something to show, that's when... That's when I tell you guys about it. You know, like one of the mistakes I made, you know, was telling everybody about the ULA pack before I was absolutely sure it was ready. And now I have to sit there. And anytime somebody asks me about that, I have to sit there with my tail between my legs. And I don't like it. I don't like it. That sucks. Yep. The Lever 11,000 is getting ready to go. My feet is getting plastered with it. So they're going to do some time. Oh, one year ago, baby. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that's nice. That's nice, too. Yeah, humans are weird. Yeah, figuring out what makes the brain tick and being introspective is kind of the stuff I was talking about yesterday. Uh, figuring out what makes this work is one of the like and why this does what it does or just the patterns with how this thing works has helped me immensely oh look at that thing well that's pretty nice cool that's hot that's really nice so what is your prediction for tomorrow will we see it, see it to stage separation i have a feeling this one's gonna go eyes up i think it'll make it i think it'll make it to splashdown but i'm ever optimistic so Take what I say with a grain of salt. So, let me just bring everybody up to speed, just in case there's some new faces around, okay? That is SpaceX's Starship. Starship Super Heavy Transport System, all right? Tomorrow, hopefully, tomorrow we are, if everything goes right, Jeb willing, uh, we will see this thing go. I mean, it's not looking good right now, but we'll see. So, Little word on Starship. Starship is nine meters wide. It's a nine meter core diameter, which is what you say with rockets, right? It's nine meters, nine meter wide. So we're talking about 33 feet, 
33 feet wide, and the thing is probably, oh, I don't know, uh, like 110 meters tall. So we're pushing almost 350 feet with the total stack here. It is by far and away the biggest and most powerful rocket ever designed, ever. That's why everybody has high anticipation for this thing flying tomorrow. This mission here is a test flight. The, the name of it is IFT-2, all right? Integrated Test Flight 2. The object of this is to get into space. That's the, that's the whole point. Now, there are some secondary missions here involved with Starship and Super Heavy. The first stage, Super Heavy, will do a small boost back, well, not really a boost back burn, but it will actually turn around, get bus go business end, right, and land, quote unquote, out in the Gulf of Mexico to test Super Heavy propulsive landing. And then if Starship does get that far, right, if it does get that far, Starship will do a once around orbit and it will land in Hawaii. Uh, not, not on the islands. It'll land in what's called the Pacific Testing Range. Uh, the Pacific Testing Range is a testing range for missiles that the Department of Defense uses that's basically up here. Uh, it's north, north, northwest of Hawaii out here. This is where they do a lot, of, a lot of missile testing where basically nobody can see it because it's out in the middle of an ocean. Starship, if launched, will fly out over the Gulf of Mexico. It'll basically fly between Florida and Cuba here, down over the Bahamas, and it'll come down, if it makes it, it'll come down over here and do it, hopefully makes it through re-entry and test propulsive landing and land basically somewhere out here. It's going to try, if I'm understanding this right, it will try to do this, the flip over and propulsive landing down. If They may have changed the plan, or I'm probably misremembering. If not, it'll just do a belly flop right into the water. Yeah, it, yeah no propulsive landing. Scratch that. I was thinking of something else. It's not going to do that, but it's not going to do that, but it will, whoop, it'll try to do a controlled crash. I guess. The ship will crash land. Yep, yep. Are you going to be doing NSF coverage? I'm not signed up for NSF coverage, Zizep, just because my plans. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, hopefully, this whole thing, this whole thing will make it. If this thing splashes down and belly flops into the Pacific Ocean... It is considered, it will be considered basically 100% successful. Um, when will there be another loon, uh, moon landing, Talby? Um, if everything goes right, probably 2026. Um, it's hard to tell because there's just so much stuff that you've got to figure out and get working. Even during the Apollo program, with the full effort of the, like, the U.S. in the 60s, which... Let's be real. It's pretty. That's a lot. That's like Herculean force right there, right? Uh, with full effort and a blank check, it still took us about. It still took us. Let's see. 1961 is when Kennedy kind of came up with the Apollo program. 63 is really when it took off, uh, and then we landed in 69. So it still took us about eight years. Now, we don't have the full effort and. Uh, no, I'm not going to say we don't have the full effort. We do have the full effort, but we don't have a blank check this time around. So it's going to take a little bit longer. But as we get closer to a planned landing, the, the landing date will come more into focus, right? Because sometimes, like, okay, let me, let me give you an example. This stuff is, so SLS, for instance. SLS, it's been a year since Artemis 1 launched. Uh, Artemis 1 was the first test flight of the booster of SLS and the Orion capsule, and it basically worked excellent. It was probably one of the most successful and comprehensive test flights we've ever done. So the effort is still there, right? The effort is absolutely still there. I mean, it's very rare that you launch a rocket and it works pretty much 100% successful on the first try. That rarely ever happens. Uh, it, let alone with one of the biggest rockets ever made, right? But if you rewind back to like 2017, 
A hurricane hit New Orleans, I think it was 2017 or 2018, and damaged the production facilities for SLS, and that shifted the schedule back at least a year. Seriously, not a lot of people know that. And I don't know why, you know, everybody harps on SLS for being so late, right? But seriously, the hurricane that came through that hit Michoud damaged the facilities so much, they contaminated the facilities, basically it punched a hole in the roof. And with rocket science, everything needs to be perfectly pristine. It has to be... It has to be very clean because you don't want any foreign object debris or FOD. And if, a, if you know, you have a whole factory floor that's basically FOD free and a hurricane punches a hole through it, like a branch comes through it or something, you have to basically stop and clean everything up because you have to maintain continuity of cleanliness so your rocket works correctly, right? That Amongst other things. So, you know, that pushed it back by a year, at least, at the very least, and then COVID on top of that. But... So what I'm trying to tell you is that it takes, it, it's, it's hard to see tall when it's going to come into focus, but you know, we're post one year of the test flight. Artemis two is scheduled to go off a year from now. NASA has done reworking on their mobile launcher because the, the, the vehicle worked fine. The launch pad, not so much. Um, the launch pad got really damaged from SLS lifting off, uh, Oops, it blew the doors off the mobile launcher. Like, not a lot of people realize that when those rocket engines ignite, what goes down through the mobile launcher and goes into the flame trench is a pressure, a pressure wave when the rocket engine turns on because you go from ambient pressure to like instantly. It, it, that pressure wave is like on par with a pressure wave that you'd encounter from like a nuclear blast. So some of the pad got a little damaged from SLS when it went off. It had a lot of uh, a lot of freedom coming out the bottom, you know what I mean? So what I'm trying to tell you is that it's hard to say exactly when it's going to go. You know, it comes into focus really it, it really starts to come into focus the closer you get to you know, the rocket being operational. Now that sometimes that takes time. If I had to put my finger on it, the way NASA's going barring some like crazy catastrophic event like a hurricane or something, you know, knock on wood, I'd probably say late 2026. Yeah, 2025 for the first crew test flight, which is Artemis 2, which is, dude, Artemis 2 is a ballsy mission. It is a ballsy mission. Uh, that, that, super dangerous. <laughs> like, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Anytime, you know, we, we, it seems like we got low Earth orbit kind of under control with, like, the ISS and Dragon and, you know, the space shuttle prior to that, right? Like, you know, I mean, the space shuttle notwithstanding, right? You know, Soyuz capsules, you got that kind of... Dude, you're upping the difficulty once you get humans outside of the magnetic field. That's, like, the difference between playing Halo on Heroic and playing Halo on Legendary. Like, I just may have dated myself there, but whatever. Whatever. If you know, you know. Heroic was pretty hard. Legendary is impossible. Right? Like, impossible. Right? What's the Artemis 2 mission, simply put? Okay, so... The first... The first launch, Artemis 1, was testing the capsule and the launch vehicle. You want to make sure your launch vehicle is good to go before you put people on it, right? And the way NASA tests is they do all the... They do as much ground testing as possible, right? And then they put the vehicle together and fly it. That does take a long period of time. It is a little bit longer than the iterative stuff you see with SpaceX. But NASA does all-up testing. Um, NASA does all-up testing. So they test everything as much as possible on the ground. And then you hit the go button. You can see that pressure wave right there, believe it or not. That's the pressure wave, this, con this cloud of condensation that blew the doors off the mobile launcher. Yeah, fun fact. Anyway, so... First mission tested the booster, it tested the capsule, and sent it out to the moon to make sure that the capsule can stay out there for long periods of time, because if we're going to go to the moon more, we want to do extended missions, and the capsule is your way home, and you have to make sure it stays out there for long periods of time without breaking. That makes sense? So, what's the second mission going to do? The second mission, Artemis 2, will look pretty much on the outside, it'll look exactly like that. It'll look very similar. The difference is, is that the capsule will have life support systems on board and four souls will be aboard. Uh, Christina Cook, um, Jeremy Hansen, Victor Glover, and Reed Wiseman. They're three NASA astronauts and Jeremy Hansen is a Canadian astronaut. 
good dude. He's a he's a he's a proper guy. Oh yeah, real real good really good guy. Oh yeah. So why is this a ballsy mission? Here, let me show you. NASA has these actually really, really freaking cool uh, infographics uh, about said mission. So, if you look, Artemis 2, here's the mission profile. All right, now this is very simplified, obviously. It's rocket science, it's pretty freaking complicated. So, you gotta launch with SLS, right? There's SLS has the two boosters and then your core stage, right? And what SLS is going to do is what's called a HEO insertion. High Earth Orbit Insertion. So it's, a, it's what's called a high energy transfer trajectory. Um, that is going to shoot the Orion capsule into a higher orbit. And then the stage, the upper stage, which is an interim cryogenic propulsion stage, right? Is going to boost them outside of the magnetic fields even more after that. Um, high energy insertions require a lot of power, which is why you need that big freaking lifter. So... Once the lifter shoots them into a higher trajectory orbit, this thing will boost the apogee of said orbit into a much higher orbit. So that's where eight is right here, okay? That's, this is what's called a high eccentric high orbit insertion trajectory, or high orbit transfer, I guess, if you really want to call it something. Basically, SLS will put it into a slightly egg-shaped egg -shaped orbit, and then the stage will put it into a very egg-shaped orbit. Orbits around celestial bodies can really only be two shapes. All right, well, three if you really want to count suborbital. Suborbital means it's an arc, right? Orbital is more of a circle, right? If you're in a zero eccentricity orbit, it's this perfect circle, or it can be egg-shaped. The more egg-shaped or the more elliptical your orbit is, it increases a orbital parameter called... It means you have an increased orbital parameter called eccentricity, right? Eccentricity means that your orbit is more eccentric. Like, uh, think like uh, if you like cars, like a camshaft, right? Cam is an eccentric, eccentric lobe that actuates the valves on an engine. But I digest. No. Um, so the stage is going to put it into a very high orbit. High orbits are dangerous because you're outside of the magnetic fields. Now, don't get me wrong. It's... It's not like, oh, they're going to go out there and get fried. No, 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 no. <laughs> There's the thing about the magnetic field, and a lot of people that don't, you know, understand the moon landings realize this. You know, how do they get past the magnetic field? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a belt. The magnetic field is a Van Allen belt. It's not a Van Allen sphere, right? You can go around them. Magnetic field is the strongest around Earth's equator. It's the weakest up at the poles. That's why you have aurora effects right? You have the Borealis and the Australia, Australia, Australis. That's what that is. The magnetic field's weak up there. So they put it into kind of a tilted orbit and they go around. They go around the magnetic fields. This is where this gets a little hairy because now you're up there, like the Apollo astronauts were, you're up there in deep, what's called deep space. Anytime you're outside of Earth's magnetic field, which is basically what prevents us from being microwaved down here on the surface, uh, like a like think peep in a microwave, you know, you ever, you ever, you know, Easter, you put the, you put the marshmallow, marshmallow duck in the microwave and it blows up. It's, it's freaking hilarious. But then you have to clean it up, which is not hilarious. But anyway, so six, seven, and eight are the danger. Well, actually it's more like five to eight is the dangerous part of the mission, or at least one of the dangerous parts. So Five here is insertion into that eccentric orbit where you're going outside of the magnetic magnetic field. Now you have what's called a Proxops demonstration. Orion needs to rendezvous with other vehicles, like a lander, for instance, when it you know, when we eventually land down back on the moon, it needs to rendezvous with the lander, so they have to make sure that it can dock to stuff. So they're gonna separate from the stage, and what Orion is going to do is do maneuvers, basically fly loops. That's what this is over here. Basically go to the left of the stage, go back to the front, go up and over and down, basically, basically to make sure that Orion can maneuver around with its thrusters. That's pretty dangerous because you're near an upper stage, right? I mean, don't get me wrong, the upper stage probably would be inerted by that point, but they're basically going to simulate a docking with this. Uh, there's no docking ports on that stage. Orion's just going to basically maneuver close. And proximity operations, or RPOD, Rendezvous Proximity Operations and Docking, are are called RPOD operations, and those RPOD operations are dangerous. 
you're flying two spacecraft really close to each other. Even though it doesn't seem like much, think about like, uh, you know, if you have fighter jets that are flying in formation, they don't look like, it doesn't look like it's that big of a deal them flying in formation, but then you realize they're, you know, that's two fighter jets. If they touch each other, that's game over. <laughs> Basically doing rendezvous and proximity operations is about the same thing. You, you really only want the spacecraft to attach in one way. <laughs> So they have to make sure they can precisely maneuver around the stage. That Once again, that's what this stuff is behind me, right? Uh, Creeper, I'll believe that when I see it. Turbo Fire, not sure if you see my messages because you're explaining, but let me know if you ever want a private tour at NASA or anything space related. I mean, Turbo, I'm going down... I'm going down to the Cape Canaveral with my uh, in-laws in a week. And uh, it would be cool to, you know, maybe show them a little more than the Saturn V Center. I'm just saying, shoot me a DM, dude. Your father-in-law was the vice president of Orion. He just retired a few months ago. The VP? So he served under Howard Hugh, if I'm remembering correctly, yeah? Yeah, Howard Hughes, the president of Orion Operations at Lockheed. Cool, man. Yo, uh, yeah, yo, you, you, you want to get me in the VAB? Not to be kidding. So, that part where you, Dr. Haas, bro, look him up. I, I'm doing it. No sh. I mean, I mean, or I, I've <laughs> turbo fire. I've been saying here for like almost a decade that Orion is one of the chadliest spacecraft ever designed. Every melon farmer on here that comes in his red Wikipedia page just said, Oh, it's a better Apollo capsule. I'm like, yeah, it is a better Apollo capsule. You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> It, it is a better, it's a way better Apollo capsule than what Orion can do is, will frankly blow people's minds. Send me your email. Oh, okay. Uh, give me a moment. There you go, pal. Okay, I'll talk to him later. Thank you. Thousand thank yous, Turbo Fire. Yeah, I would, dude, that, yeah, that would be, that would be fantastic. So, yeah, I mean, I'm looking to, you know, this is, I'm looking to impress the in-laws a little bit, you know what I'm saying? If you want to do me a solid, I always like scoring points. You never, you should never stop scoring points with the in-laws, all right? Never stop scoring points, all right? On a separate note, can I link you a YouTube vid you have to watch later? Yeah, sure, Hayes. Link it up. But anyway, so these rendezvous proximity operations are the first phase of the mission. After that, after they prove that the capsule can maneuver around and stuff, they're going to get to the bottom of that lobe-shaped orbit, like the egg-shaped orbit, where they're going the fastest and use a little bit of Earth's gravity coupled with the Orion's SPS, Service Propulsion System, basically the rocket that's on the back of the capsule, to shoot out on a um, a translunar injection is what it's called, TLI. I'm sure if you're a l even a little bit of a space fan, you've heard TLI before. Yep. All right, all flight controllers were go for TLI. Y you've heard that before. That's basically the transfer orbit to get to the moon, right? Will this be a harder G launch than, say, the shuttle? Or, or, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's going to be about the same because you can throttle the shuttle the shuttle engines. You know what I mean? Get them on for an interview. Yeah, maybe. We'll think about it. Think about it. So the translunar injection burn is the real, real dangerous part. Why? Why is this super dangerous? Well, one, you're going outside of the magnetic field again. Two, you're going outside of the magnetic field again, and you ain't coming back for a little while. There's no brakes. There's no brakes on this. You could turn the you could turn the capsule 180 degrees and fire backwards. 
but you they have all that velocity because you know when you're in that egg-shaped orbit that eccentric orbit and you get to what's called perigee or lowest point lowest point is the fastest point so they can use falling back towards earth combined with the propulsion system to boost out to the moon now you used a lot of earth's gravitational pull to put you on this trajectory now don't get me wrong what this trajectory is called here so 9 10 and 11 12 that's called a free return which is basically where you use the moon's gravity to push you to basically throw you back towards earth right think kind of like a like a pinball machine almost uh but when you're out here in the transfer that's super dangerous that's where apollo 13 had problems and the reason why apollo 13 was so dangerous is because you you can't turn around you're going to the moon whether you like it or not and Apollo 13 had to do a trajectory similar to this. So the reason why this is called a free return trajectory is because as the capsule gets further away from, from Earth, right, it slows down. Why? If you take a tennis ball and you throw it up in the air, the tennis ball eventually will stop for a split second and it'll come back down. At the highest point of any trajectory of something that's on a planet or even around a planet, right, that's when you're going the slowest. This is that's called an apogee when you're around Earth. Apogee and perigee. Perigee is the lowest, fastest. Apogee is the highest, slowest. So the capsule will slow down. It'll slow down to a relative velocity that's enough for the moon's gravity to pull it in. Now, if you wanted to stay at the moon, you'd get to what you'd get to number eleven right here. Number eleven is called a perilune or a parasynthian. All right, that's the lowest point in your orbit around the moon. If they wanted to turn that, that's where you'd want to turn the capsule around and fire. And if you fired it, you can capture. You slow down enough to where the moon's gravity will keep you there, right? But we're not doing that this time around. That's for the next mission. They don't want to test too many. You don't want to test too many things at once, right? So you make incremental. This is incremental testing, right? So what they're basically going to do is they're going to use the moon's gravity to turn the capsule 180 degrees. They're going to use the lunar grav well and fly through Parasynthian and it put it on a trajectory uh, called, which is called retro, retrograde gravity assisting, right? That will shoot, shoot you back towards, the, towards Earth. Now, once again, they do have to make small course corrections with the capsule here and there just to make sure you're on the right trajectory because the kicker here is that gravitational pull around Earth and the moon and frankly, any celestial body, anything floating around in space, the gra your mom, the gravitational pull will be different. It's non-uniform. It isn't a perfect grav well. So they have to do small course corrections with those same thrusters and the service propulsion system, right? Uh, to, to maneuver around the stage. Right? So from here, you, you use the moon's gravity coupled with slight minute thruster movements to basically shoot back towards Earth and then the capsule will separate from the service module. Capsule will turn around, expose its heat shield to the incoming atmosphere and basically skip off the atmosphere like, a, like throwing a stone into a lake and having it skip. It'll do that. It'll do something very similar to that. And the capsule even, even rotates a little bit during, during that skip maneuver to change the angle of attack of the heat shield. But that, that is a whole other thing that I could talk to you guys about. And then the capsule will come back down, parachutes, land in the ocean. Uh, an amphibious assault ship from the U.S. Navy will go and pick it up with a, something with a well deck. They'll bring the capsule into the well deck and drain the well deck, and then people get out. It's it is a ballsy freaking mission. That's hardcore. If this mission goes, it's supposed to go about a year from now, believe it or not. So twenty late twenty twenty five. If this mission goes, it'll be the first time humans have been outside of the magnetic field since December of nineteen seventy two. Yeah. Now. I, here's the biggest question. This is the question I get asked by far and away the most from anybody with space. Uh, why haven't we been back in so long? Money? The will to? You know, you have a project that you're working on and you know, in your spare time, like fixing a car or restoring something or building a model kit. Why don't you do it? Why don't you do it right now? Well, <laughs> so yeah, you gotta want to. We gotta want to. And the money has to be there. I mean, that's another thing, but... Yep. There you go. November 2024. Yeah. Yeah, that. Yeah. I forgot what year it was. My internal clock has been screwed up since COVID. I don't know about you guys. But anyway. Um, 
What's the margin of error for translunar injection? Shipmaster, it entirely depends on your thrusters and what you're using. With the, with the reaction control system, so smaller thrusters. So Orion has like three sets of thrusters on it. One is the service propulsion system, and then you have your orbiter maneuvering and control thrusters, and then you have your reaction control systems. Basically, big thruster, medium thruster, small thruster. You can make minute course corrections with the smaller thrusters, but if you need to do something a little bit bigger, they can use the medium-sized thrusters. And then you have the big boy thruster, which is the SPS. So you can make minute course corrections. That's what, that's what that RPOD operation is about with Orion, so you can make those minute corrections. Ha <laughs> thrust. Am I sleeping in tomorrow? Probably not. Yeah, I know, Zizep, right? Yeah. Could have been there last year, but your cat got sick. Sag. Sag. So, hey, Asmalak with the eight-month resub. And Turbofire, thank you for reaching out, dude. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. Uh, that would be that would be really cool, man. Astronauts are cool, Arrow. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I'm just going back and chat. Yeah, yeah, Wollahan, yeah. See, I, I anticipated that. <laughs> Everybody asks, why haven't we done it since the Apollo program? Um, well, I could give you a bunch of reasons, but I'll be very, very candid here. We don't have, we haven't had the stones to do it. Now we do. Yeah, yeah. It took, it took a space shuttle blowing up to do it. But hey, whatever. That sucks, you know. That, you know, that that that's terrible, but it is what it is, man. The ship transport stand is entering the launch site. Have they developed better rad shielding? Um, WD-40, you know what the you know what the honest thing is? An aluminum-based pressure vessel is really good at bouncing out, you know, deep space radiation. It's really good at it. it the aluminum re will reflect it, like aluminum reflects light. It, it's actually not the worst. I mean, think about it, dudes. Look at all the Apollo astronauts. I mean, we, uh, you know, we lost TK Mattingly and Frank Borman, who are two Apollo astronauts, very recently. 50 years after the fact. They went outside of low Earth orbit, no problem. Just something to consider. Yep, yeah, Grimblow, yeah. I mean, you don't want to do it with that. Hope, you know, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it is what it is. Does orientation affect gravitational slingshot uh, other than thruster corrections? Not really, Miguel. It's all about velocity and direction of velocity. The way the spacecraft is pointed... I mean, if you're going to do a burn, you, you'd want to fire the engine at certain times to be more efficient. All right. It really depends on what type of orbit you're doing. Now, in orbital mechanics, there is kind of six different, more or less directions that you can go. Six different cardinal directions. So your compass, instead of having four directions, it has six. Right. So that compass, so to speak, is oriented how they find kind of the orientation. Like, okay, say you have a compass and you have magnetic north and it's pointing towards north, right? And you can orient the compass correctly to figure out your cardinal directions. You orient off the magnetic field. The spacecraft uses the direction that it's going to orient that six-axis compass, okay? So going the way that you're going, so wherever the velocity is pointing at, that's where you orient the compass off. That's called prograde or posigrade velocity. So that means that's the direction you're going. There's posigrade, and then if you've watched any sci-fi, you know what the the one that's opposite of prograde or posigrade. The one that's opposite is retrograde. Uh, I'm sure anyone here that's watched sci-fi has heard, oh, retro thrusters firing. They never use the term right, but that basically means you're slowing down because you're going the op you're pointing your you're pointing your spacecraft opposite the direction of your on of your ongoing velocity that slows you down. That's hitting the brakes. The other axis here are, well, it's difficult to orient other axis depending on what you're orienting around, but the other four cardinal directions are what's called normal, anti-normal, radial in, radial out, okay? Radial in and radial out, basically, if this is the ground of the planet that you're orbiting around, the spacecraft is coming around, radial in is pointing towards the grav well. So that's perpendicular, 90 degrees inward to prograde velocity. Radial out is pointing outwards, also perpendicular to prograde velocity. So there's left and right. Left and, <laughs> left and right is uh, radial and radial out basically is pointing towards the planet or thing that you're orbiting around or pointing away. The last two are called, they're called coplanar normal and anti-normal. All right, so what does that mean? 
normal. So if, you know, prograde is this way, retrograde is this way, radial in is that way, radial out is that way. Normal, anti-normal. It's up and down. So you have forward and back, left, right, up and down. And now keep in mind, radial in, radial out, coplanar normal, coplanar anti-normal, those can change. It depends on where your space, what your spacecraft is oriented off of on the roll axis. But coplanar normal and anti-normal are basically a perpendicular burn. Like if this is your, the ground of your celestial body here, coplanar normal is this way and anti-normal is that way, up and down. Radial in is this way, radial out is that way, prograde, retrograde. Now, here's the thing. The, why the heck did I tell you all that? Did you get all of it? Everybody got that? Why did I tell you all this? Well, it depends. You utilize each one of these things at certain points during your orbit. The, the two that get utilized the most by a long shot are prograde and retrograde. Why? Why would you do that? Well, in orbital mechanics, you need a lot of velocity. Let's just take low Earth orbit, for instance. 17,500 miles an hour, about 27,500 kph to get into orbit. It's fast. It's fast. It's fast. So, basically, if you're going 17,500 miles an hour in that direction, it's not very efficient to turn 90 degrees and try to burn in another direction. Think about it like a car. If I'm going 160 kilometers an hour to a four-way intersection that has 90 degree corners, like you, one you'd find in a, in a city, for instance, right? And I'm going 160 kph, it's 100 miles an hour, and I want to take a left, and it's like a stop sign, and it's a 90 degree tight corner. Tur does turning the wheel to the left make you whoop, go around the corner? No, absolutely not. You keep going straight. And your car probably flips over and then keeps going straight right? You ever seen the movies where somebody jerks the wheel, a car starts slipping over, but it keeps going in the direction that it was going, even though it's rolling sideways, right? <laughs> yeah, conservation of momentum, exactly. Spacecraft are the same way. Those radial in, radial out burns, normal, anti-normal burns, they're very inefficient. They are super inefficient because your spacecraft has... Well, it has a lot of kinetic energy going in that direction and trying to go against that, against that momentum is not very efficient for a thruster. So going with that, so prograde or against that with retrograde where you're basically going 180 degrees away from the direction that you're going, that's pretty efficient because you're, you're basically, because this is getting into trig here. Uh, your rocket engine is basically pushing exactly 180 degrees opposite of the direction that you're going. So that's more efficient than going 90 degrees because you're taking a cosine loss and thrust, and then there's the vacuum, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever, prograde and retrograde are the ones that get utilized the most because that will boost your orbit higher or bring your orbit down depending on when and where you burn. But yeah, normal, anti-normal, radial in, radial out, those don't really get utilized too much. But you, the RCS, the reaction control systems, are pointed in all those cardinal directions. You have forward and back small thrusters, up and down small thrusters, left and right small thrusters. Those thrusters are used to make small corrections on the normal and, uh, normal and radial axis. Does that make sense? NASA orbital mechanics video time. <laughs> You just drift around the corner. Well, spacecraft's just drifting around Earth the entire time in here. Think about that for a second. You get the directions if you play KSP. <laughs> yep. Yeah, Miguel, no problem, dude. Hi, I've joined your streams recently since the launch of Cities 2. However, all this space talk is really intriguing. Your knowledge seems extensive. May I ask what your background is? Self-taught, Fruity. Self-taught. I play cities a lot. My main game, which I probably have like 10, 20,000 hours in, somewhere around there, is Kerbal Space Program. I teach people about orbital mechanics. Now, don't get me wrong. I love civil engineering and highway building and stuff in cities. That scratch is a pretty awesome, pretty good itch. But space flight is my number one. It always has been. I l <sighs> Sending people back to the moon is going to be a very good day for your boy. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. <laughs> Yeah. I hate to tell you this, but the IFT2 stream on Twitter has been updated and now says the 18th. Hmm. 
Uh, gullies, you don't think efficiency, you think efficiency is the wrong term here. You still get your del you still get your delta V, doesn't matter which direction, just your transit to that planned orbit needs more delta V. Y yeah, I'm talking about efficiency and utilizing the effects of gravi gravity. You're, you're getting confused with specific impulse. Yeah, I, I know, there's a difference. There's, if you want me to put it another way for you, yes, there are certain times in your orbit where you want to utilize the least amount of delta V to get the most bang for your buck. I've been using that, op, so optimal, what's called an optimal transfer, uh, I've been saying that's more efficient. Don't get confused with specific impulse though. Specific impulse is the efficiency of your engine. Your efficiency of engine has nothing to do with efficiency of... I mean, it does, but in the context of this conversation, is it doesn't have a lot to do with the efficiency of like finding the most opportune transfer to change your orbit and what orbital parameter you're trying to change. Those six cardinal directions will change the six. Uh, not, <laughs> it's not one for one, but they're, you know, like think about and th Gruel, this isn't for you. This is for everybody else. Um, orbits have variables, right? Think like X and Y on a grid will get you, like a Cartesian coordinate, it'll get you points on a grid, right? Negative X, negative Y, positive X, positive Y, and then positive Z, negative Z, right? Now, spacecraft don't use X, Y, and Z, but there are six variables for orbits that define shape and size and position of orbit. The two that get dealt with, actually, the three that get dealt with the most are what's called semi-major axis, which is half of the major axis, right? You have orbital inclination, which is your tilt relative to the celestial body's equatorial plane that you're orbiting around. And then eccentricity, which is the one we talk about, the egg-shaped orbit. Each one of those burns, prograde, retrograde, normal, normal, anti-normal, radial in, radial out, those at certain points of an orbit will change different parameters. Now here's where, this is rocket science, it gets complicated, okay? Prograde and retrograde burns, for the most part, will change eccentricity and nothing else, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that normal anti-normal is going to change inclination only. And radial in, radial out is going to change, you know, uh, what's the other another orbital parameter that we didn't talk about called longitude of ascending node. It depends on where you are in your orbit, if you really want to know. Here's the link. SpaceX has updated There's in the 18th. Do they have to take the size of the crew into effect like weight and height? Yeah, of course. I'm a civil engineer and I've also loved space stuff, so I'm grateful for this channel. Yeah, no problem, Miguel. Yeah, yeah. Mm hmm. Well, Miguel, if you... Well, that actually makes things a lot easier for me because I don't have to... I don't have to speak generally, right? So think about, Miguel, did you, you remember um, like how, how to, in road design, getting the radius, like how, how you get the radius for a road that goes around something? Like in, in cities, it's just <laughs> place it and they're using splines to do all the math for you, right? But if you want to make a road curve in real life, you know the math that you need to do to get that, right? It orbits kind of like that. It's kind of like that, but it's kind of not, but it's similar similar concept. You have a bunch of, you have like your, you know, your cord length and then your radius and then your points, right? Orbital parameters are similar to that, but it's not similar in that the math is similar, but it's similar that it has a lot of different variables. Hey, Joe, give, give this up to Miguel. Mm -hmm. I did hear that, Bandit. That's a shame. I know about practical engineering, Granny. Yeah, yeah. It's a good YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. How's your back doing? I'm fine, Hammer Nails. I've been resting it and I've been <clears throat> stretching and stuff. Well, live stream moved to Saturday, so, well, that sucks. Well, I mean, actually, you know what? Hold up. Hold up one second. I'm asking Brimo, when is our flight out on Saturday? <sighs> yeah.
Yeah, and Canberra had to Google Translate on that last one. Sorry for the English. Miguel, your English is fine. I wouldn't have known that English was your second language if you didn't tell me a second ago. I thought they weren't allowed to launch on the weekends. Don't know. Yeah, Joe, they're, it looks like they're getting ready to de-stack, which sucks. But what are you going to do? What are you going to do? The good goods. What are you gonna do? Oh, my room. Uh... Ah. They saw something they didn't like. Well, of course. Uh, give me one second. I'm going to assume that the Saturday, Saturday, it's a two hour window again. And if it's a two hour window, dudes, I might be able to do it. Uh, Nibirius, that's... Do we have official word from SpaceX? I'm not 100% sure, but all their streams are saying Saturday now. No official word yet. Okay. Yeah, see here, this is Chris B over at NASA Space Flight. He basically said, uh, yeah, see, SpaceX's streams are set for November 18th at 12.29 p.m. Huh? Huh. Uh, okay. Yeah, it looks like we're getting a, oh, UK time for him. Yeah, okay, so 12.29 would be... 8.29. Yeah. No, 7... 7.29 Central. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. Time zones and stuff. <laughs> Elon, please. Yeah, so... Okay, push back 40... 48 hours? Uh, yeah. From now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Could still be a placeholder. It's the same window as IFT one, so it's a it's a two hour window. If it's a two hour window starting at starting at seven thirty central, I'll uh, yeah I should be able to cover that. Sure, no problem. That actually that actually would work. I basically need to watch the coverage, see how far it goes, stop, and then get right in my car to go to the airport. But hey, whatever. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Oh boy! What's more important? This is the in-laws we're talking about, Shipmaster. You know, <laughs> gotta be careful, man. <laughs> now they'll, you know what? They're space nuts too. They'll probably understand it, but I can't miss. I can't miss the flight, dude. <laughs> Do you know astrophysics as well? I know how spacecraft fly through space smoked. Now, what that entirely d entails, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I suppose I'd know a little bit of astrophysics, but yeah. As long as we're not in a plane or at Disney, I'll be able to cover it. Your parents are cool like that. Yep, yep. The time went back to tomorrow. Oh, why, why must you play these games? Oh. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> Why must you play these games with me? <laughs> I'm in a glass case of emotion! <laughs> we have hardwood, Clayton, and it's, it's nice. How about you wait for SpaceX to say if it's delay or not? Yeah, okay. I'm mostly kidding. But yeah, 
you know, if it's a morning launch window, window, I could probably do it on Saturday. It's just basically all a Saturday afternoon traveling, so I wouldn't be able to cover it. Once I get in Florida, you know, I know people. You know, I know. I have a lot of I have a lot of contacts down there. I know. I know people. We should be able to we should be able to get some Florida coverage for you. But oh dear. We'll see. Oh, burb. The LR eleven thousand is moving to the OLM. Yep, there's something. Some something on something on Starship. Something about it's something about you though. Uh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. yep. Uh let's see. I think it's going to be a quick destack and restack because now it's the 17th again. We'll see, man. We'll see. The weather sucks in Florida right now, so hopefully it clears up for when you're here. Isn't there a uh, a tropical storm or something that's like off the coast? You had Empire out today, and here I was looking at hardwood floors for the living room and carpet. Yeah, okay. Haven't seen the sun in days? Oh, okay. okay. Definitely not launching tomorrow? You, let's see. Connie, I can see the link, dude, so let me take a look. Village evacuation for tomorrow has been canceled. <sighs> yeah, well, village evac is a pretty good indicator. If you like floors, I will try them. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, Clayton, it's a floor. I don't like. I like the hardwood, but hardwoods, you got to vacuum a lot because yeah, dust and stuff builds up on them, and it looks terrible. But hey, whatever. That's what the Roomba is for. That was NSF's fear yesterday. If it doesn't launch within a day or so, the scrub would be a lengthy one because of the storm inbound. Really? You still don't understand why they launch rockets from ground level. Why not a mountain somewhere on the equator? Um, Spell, I could get into logistics, supply chains, blah, 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 blah. Um, I'll, I'll speak very... Why use more words when few do trick? How fast does a rocket get to 30,000 feet? The answer is probably like 30 to 45 seconds. Yeah, 30 to 45 seconds. It doesn't take very long. Now, think about it like this. Yeah, you're using more fuel. Not that much more fuel to get, to get up there. But think about all the time and effort it's going to take to build a launch site on top of Mount Everest, for instance. Mount Everest is what, 27,000 feet? How are you going to build a launch pad up there? Why would you do that? Rockets get to that altitude in less than a minute. Not even worth not even worth it. Not worth it at all. <laughs> the, the amount of efficiency that you gain in aerodynamic and, you know, obviously delta V like what we were talking about before, uh, delta V for the people that don't know is your basically your range. Rockets Rockets range, so how far they can go, is not measured in distance. It's measured in acceleration. It's measured in speed. Speed is the name of the game with spaceflight, which is why I like it. Because I want to go fast. So, Spell, think, think about it. How are you going to take a rocket like Falcon 9? Not even 
a big rocket comparatively like Starship or SLS. Falcon 9's a, you know, it's a heavy duty rocket. It's a heavy hitter, but it's not that big of a rocket compared to the big boys, right? How are you going to get that up there? Why? You, you can't use a helicopter. Helicopters can't fly that high. So you've got to build a road to the top of a mountain that will make your launch site, right, at a height, potentially, that a rocket basically gets to in about 20 to 30 seconds. It's not worth it. It's not Logistically, that makes no sense. Just make a bigger rocket, right? James Webb got launched next to the, close to the equator because you get a free velocity gain because Earth is not a perfect sphere. Anybody that says the Earth is, is a perfect sphere is an idiot. Earth is a big jello mold of iron and nickel, and we're floating on the cooled crust of that iron and nickel jello mold. So if you had like a deflate or like a ball of jello and you tried to spin it, what would happen? It would bulge out at the center because it's freaking jello. I hate jello. Ah, oh, come on, man. There's always room for jello. Right? That's what Earth is like. So you get a free velocity gain imparted on your vehicle launching closer to the equator if you're trying to get into an equatorial orbit, what's called a low inclined orbit. Yeah, sure, but that must have been a lot of logistics to get that. Well, fortunately, we have these big things called oceans. And putting your satellite in a boat and sailing it a little ways around the ocean is not that big of a deal compared to, we, we, don't, we can't sail a ship to the top of a mountain. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah. I did, ship. The Earth is not completely, completely round. It's, no, not at all. It is like a jello mold just kind of jiggles around. What do you think plate tectonics is? It's the jello mold jiggling, dude. <laughs> Got you. Okay. Okay, Turbo. I got you, buddy. Did you end up completing the highway tunnel last night? Yeah, Schnooze. It for the most part, it's it's pretty built. Yep, yep. We're up to like three sixty-five. Lucky. I put all the infrastructure in place to zone out a gigantic district. We're gonna hit four hundred today. No problem. Hence, deep foundations on buildings. Yeah, Miguel, exactly. You got to anchor it into something solid. Right? Yeah, evac. Yeah, exactly, Phantom. Looking like, looking like evac, the, the Boca Chica Village evacuation is canceled for tomorrow, guys. I don't think it's going to go. Go, go back to big blimps to move stuff and fill them with hydrogen. I, 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 I'm... They, uh, they, they tried that once. It didn't, it did not end very well, real. Yeah, that didn't, that didn't work very well. They, you know what the funny thing is? They used hydrogen because somebody couldn't, somebody didn't give them any helium. Hey. Seriously. The Germans were filling their dirigibles with, with helium until we cut off their helium supply. Oops. <laughs> Hi, Antares. Hey, those guys needed to... It, hey, can you blame us? Can you blame... Can you blame us? No, you can't. <laughs> hey, 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 ho, ho. <laughs> <laughs> no, you see, see, hey, they were out of line. All right, we needed to, needed to, needed to correct that. You know what I'm saying? Oh, the huge manatees. Yeah, let's go to Hand Matten. <laughs> I just bought CS2 Ultimate because of your city. Yeah, my bad, dude. Foe, I hope you don't. I hope you don't have anything important to do for a little while. 
It's about time they started farming dilithium crystals to use. I agree. I agree. <laughs> we didn't want their leader to use it to make funny voices? Well, yeah, what did you think I was talking about? You know, just work, but I say I'm sick. <laughs> okay, yeah, all right. Great, now I don't feel guilty at all. This is fine, right? <laughs> this is fine. It's good. Are we going to get helium-3? Helium-3 would be nice. Very good for fusion. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not now, Hellfish. She's on a roll. <laughs> Was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? Hell no! What? Germans? He's on a roll. Just let him do his thing. Not now. He, the, 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 the kid's way of saying that would be like, not now. He's cooking. Let him cook. <laughs> Toto's like... Us? <laughs> it's from it's from a old movie, Dodo. There's a it's called Animal House. John Belushi plays this basically a frat boy, and he's the idea is the guy's plastic. He's like, "Was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor?" Hell no! <laughs> you know, <laughs> makes a lot more sense if you say it like that. You're not old enough. Animal House is a funny movie, dude. For what it's worth, yeah. Helium four twenty sixty nine. We need that. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. H two O. If the Hindenburg disaster didn't happen, would we still use hydrogen and blimps? No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's not a good idea. Yes, I am cultured. Exactly, Rob. When I go to drink my coffee, I have my pinky out. <laughs> oh, <laughs> activist, yes. <laughs> what? Sorry. I'm confused and so are others. SpaceX changed the live stream from the 17th to the 18th and now back to the 17th. Try the, the village evac order for Boca Chica Village that's close to the launch site was canceled. And that's from somebody that we know that lives there. Probably not happening tomorrow, which... Warm! Anyway, <clears throat> yeah, it's from Mary. Exactly. Yep, yep. I want to believe, bros. Even me, space flight nutcase. I want to believe. <laughs> Please, if there's some like type of you know like element one fifteen thing that can make us like cheat laws of physics, I would. Can I just use that to go to like Venus or something? Not to the surface, but you know, like please. I just want that so we can. I want to go Star Wars around the universe. You know what I'm saying? Ardon, you're here for Starship Hype. Right on, man. You're going to be on a plane when it launches. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of... It's not the first time this has happened, Hellfish. You know, I spend copious amounts of time here. I really don't like going on vacations. But historically, that, you know, whenever Starship has a nice test, uh, Starhopper, for instance, yep, I was on a plane one time where I actually can't stream it on an aircraft. Yeah, I want to do the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. Yep, that's that's correct. Yeah, try it. I'm hyped too. Starship's a beast, man. Thank you, Jokey. What's the link to the official SpaceX stream? Uh, sh sh no, uh, give me one second. Can, can somebody post it in chat? JJ, me, can you get the link, please? You know, well, you're going to get forced into some trip the before the moon launch and you'll miss that too. No, Hellfish, I don't care what's going on. I am not missing Artemis 2. Nope. Nope. It's not Copium. I'm not... D Brimo knows good and well. I've, I've made this abundantly clear because communicating with your significant other is how you have a successful relationship. You know, some things you don't budge on. I'm not budging on that. Can confirm village evacuation for today has been canceled. Yeah, Xerax, I have the tweet up right there. The Twix, actually.
Well, Tessa, I don't know. I, I can't speak to the, the skin, the choice of like outer skin for the Zeppelin, dude. But yeah, the hydrogen inside of it is... Yeah, that was the U.S. The U.S. put an embargo on uh, Nazi Germany's helium. We said, oh, you have dirigibles? We have dirigibles. You use our helium? We don't like you. You don't use our helium anymore. It's kind of what we do. It reads. She said today. Oh, you're right. Can confirm that the village evacuation for today has been canceled. <laughs> I'm once again doing my daily ask for you to please play Children of a Dead Earth. Render. Render. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, you know what, Xerax? <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Dude, I, I couldn't close a hot dog stand right now. No, um... I don't know. I don't know, guys. You think we're reading too much into it? It might just be me huffing the hopium. <laughs> Children of a Dead Earth is advanced. What, what does that mean? <laughs> Wait for SpaceX announcement. Uh. Yeah, Spalb. You guys have questions about space? I'm your guy. I'll take any question. Lizard people. Yeah, before you ask. Yeah, I know. Weird, huh? Yeah. What? Oh, that wasn't your question? Is it? Oh, this is weird. Oh. Yeah, Xerox, well, <laughs> your English is better than mine. You noticed it. I didn't. So what does that say about me? I do English good be good, though, do. No, I'm not, Factor. No, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, for uh, yeah, dude, I've been busy. I'm sorry, man. Yeah, yeah. It's the eyes. I do have those crazy eyes sometimes, though. You got them crazy eyes. I don't know, animal. Why do they call it an oven when you're off in the when you off in the cold food? Out, hot, eat the hot, off, hot food. Uh, are you having a strong? What is dark matter and why does ID care? Dark matter could potentially be used to make energy from nothing. Well, lack of energy, but I don't, I'm not sure about dark matter. The thing with faster than light drives is the thing that you want isn't going faster than the speed of light. Physics starts to do weird things when you approach what's called the variable C. When you approach the speed of light, C e is, you know, like E equals MC squared. Yeah, that, 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 that variable. When you start, when you start to approach that, E equals MC squared starts doing some weird stuff. Yeah. We would want negative mass density. That's what you want. That's the one you want. So then you could like surf a gravity wave, man. <laughs> What does it do? Um, it's basically the physicist equivalent of dividing by zero. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it does starts doing some weird stuff. I've heard of it, Ben. I haven't read it. Yeah, Ray Render Truck. Keep it classy, Mr. Dead Earth. But, uh, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, 500 internal physics error. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's simple. Just use C squared. Problem solved. What is dark energy? It, uh, my theoretical physics is not the best to be able to answer that question, Conan, to be honest with you. I deal with practical applications of spaceflight mostly. Um, long story short, dark energy is like having a negative number exist in the world, only with energy, negative energy. That's, that theoretically is possible, but it's not like, 
Yeah, I don't know how we would go about proving that. You'd have to tear a hole in the universe or something. And I'm, I don't think, I don't think that's a thing. Multi, the multiverse. Hey, yeah, dude, Conan. Once again, I, I don't know enough about it to be able to say conclusively, dude. I'm, I'm probably wrong with what I just said. It, it turns out this, this, you know, the whole, the whole theoretical physics thing is really hard. Have you done space photography? I know people that are space photographers. Let's just call it weird. Yeah, basically, so, okay, like, if you have a gravity well, like, Earth Earth is distorting space and time. So if you picture, like, a plane, of, our plane of existence, we're going to get into some weird stuff, right? Earth, a high mass, right, uh, our high mass object is going to warp space and time. That's what a grav well is. That's what the grav, that's what the grav well is. That's what's holding you to the ground right now. That warp in space and time. Now, the crazy thing is, is we, we we know that that exists. That isn't some crazy, not saying it was aliens concept. I, that's what Einstein's theory proved. Gravity bends light. We know that. Like, that's what he proved in the 30s. Basically, they stared at a freaking, um, I think they stared at a star. And when two stars kind of, you know, in the sky, they kind of crossed each other. You could still see the light from the second star behind the first star, despite them like eclipsing each other. I think it works like that, but I I don't know it good off the top of my head. I wasn't <laughs> wasn't prepared to talk about relativity today. I I brushed up on starship knowledge, but hey, whatever. We could you know, why not? It's here, We're talking about it. Sure. Um. So, yeah, we know that gravity bends light, but yeah, and. Like, um, from what I understand, like with Higgs, the Higgs boson breakthrough, gravity can have ripples. Like if you throw a stone into a pond, gravity can ripple like that, which is pretty cool. That's what negative mass density is. That's what I'm talking about. You could theoretically have a spaceship that generates enough power, generates enough energy to basically warp space and time in front of you and make a grav well in front of you that pulls you forward. Think like a, like an EKG almost, right? So it's like, doop, doop, right? You basically make a black hole in front of you. You don't go into it, but it pulls you forward. That's, once again, if that sounds like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's weird. It's, like I said, stuff starts getting weird when you get into messing with planes of existence and stuff. Yeah, exactly, Aquilex. We we know it's there, but we really don't know what it does. <laughs> Rip fly, Friday launch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another crazy thing is... Yeah, actually, Lundprod, you reminded me. That's a really good example. So you guys want to hear something really nutty? Hubble, James Webb, the two space telescopes that we have up there. Hubble's in low Earth orbit. James Webb is at a Lagrangian point. Um, between, what is it, Earth and the Sun? It's at, it's at ESL2. Earth, Sun, Lagrangian point two, if I'm remembering correctly. The orbits don't really matter. Here's the nutso thing. You can use the gravity of another solar system bending light as a magnifying glass. So the telescope can use another solar system as a, basically, a scope to see further into the universe. It's called gravitational lensing. That's absolutely a thing. You can basically point the telescope at a solar system and you want to look at another solar system behind it, you can use it as a magnifying glass. That is something that's absolutely proven. It happens all the time. James Webb is taking pictures using gravitational lensing right now. Well, unless it's looking at something in our solar system. Pretty crazy, right? Yeah. Gravitational lensing. It's like it's basically giving your camera a longer lens on a solar system scale. <laughs> Prove it, all right? It's been proven. Now what? Hey, Dragon, what's going on? Hopefully you can tune into the stream at the factory tomorrow. So excited. Yeah, I don't know, dude. Uh, it looks like it's not going to go. How do we burn some ants with a solar system magnifying glass? With science. Is Webb strong enough to spot Voyager? No. No way. Uh, 
army trying to have James Webb go and try and, and like actually look for for Voyager would be like you I I'm, dude the scale here is basically no absolutely not it would be like you trying to see an atom with your eye without a microscope uh yeah that's the scale we're talking about here it looks like a horse you look like a horse what if they were big space ants well the only good bug is a dead bug so you know if they were big enough you know, we just zap them. Make sure you do your part. Yeah, you're not, you're not going to find it, dude. It would be like, once again, you'd need, it's like, even like using an electron microscope. Like if we're talking about that scale, like an electron microscope can see like at, I think it's subatomic if I'm remembering right, but. Uh, that, even that, that's not, that's not a good enough way to convey the, trying to find the needle in the haystack, so to speak. Ship quick, ship quick disconnect has been disconnected. Hopefully it was quick. He's afraid! I'm doing my part. Oh, spoilers, Joe, jeez. Hey, Enraged, what's going on? With the extreme temperature differences in low Earth orbit, do you think it would be feasible to create a steam-powered engine for power generation? In... Like, making an At Atkinson cycle or a Stirling engine? I saw the updates out, Butterfly. I haven't checked it. Enraged that... I don't... I don't... I mean, yeah? I don't see why not. I mean... Huh. I mean... Maybe if you had, like, a spacecraft that had windows on, like, on one side and windows on the other, and you found a way to bring the heat in through the window... And you found a way to exchange heat with the cold side, like, of the spacecraft? Maybe. I mean, yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, uh, like, a, an internal combustion engine would work up there if you have oxygen. Yeah, sure, why not? Yeah, Valentino. Yeah, gravity waves. Mm-hmm. Universal background of gravitational waves or ripples in the fabric of space and time. Yeah, pretty crazy, Johnny, huh? What I'm saying is we need to make a spacecraft that makes the wave. And then you surf the wave. And then you don't need to do faster than light. No, no, no. You don't need to worry about going faster than light. You can just go faster than you... Faster than the universe! That's what we should do. And I, believe it or not, NASA does have a division on, like... Uh, propulsion like that yeah they they are they're they're looking into it but it's just yeah it's, it's kind of hard to do nasa's kw generator is a nuclear sterling engine is it in space yeah of course pretty crazy right yeah we we, we we if we could figure that one out we could go ludicrous ludicrous speed slow we might even be able to go to plat we need what Futurama has. We don't move the universe moves around us. That's what this is. It's called, it's Alcubierre. It's Alcubierre's mathematics. Akato, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, that that's it. Yeah, yes, I agree. Futurama was written by a bunch of physicists and math majors. That's why how the ship works in Futurama is how that type of propulsion that I'm talking about could work because the people who wrote Futurama are a bunch of nerds. Yeah, we'll play cities. Mm -hmm. Oh, so a magic carpet ride. All right, cool. Sounds good. So Steppenwolf was right. 
What? Didn't Futurama cause a few papers to be published as well? By the people that wrote the show, Kiranov. Yes, they wrote they wrote they wrote a th they wrote a paper about something in Futurama. Maybe it was the ship propulsion, I don't remember. Will you ever play Children of a Dead Earth, Dead Earth one day? I think you'd really love it since you're a space nerd. Maybe at some point, Render. No guarantees. I, I got a lot on my plate right now, dude. It was the mind swapping one. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to do my own aviation, aviational research. Just aviation. No, aviational isn't a word, Rude. I'm trying if I can. Trying to see if I can crash an airplane into a space rocket in cities. I'm 15 launches, but no cigar. I don't think so. I don't think there there's there's no collision detection box on the rocket or because on the rocket or the plane because the, if you were doing that, they would have to be physically simulated inside of the computer, which would roast your processor already more than what cities does already. Ah, oh, there you go. How fish neat. I wonder where that Tesla is. It's in a heliocentric, eccentric orbit with aphelion above Mars' semi-major axis and perihelion below Earth's semi-major axis. It's, it's in an orbit that's halfway between Earth and Mars. Does that make sense? Which, which one made sense? The first one or the second one? Did you talk to the guy? I don't know, Lava. Like I said, I don't. I want. I want Star Wars and Star Trek drives just as much as the next guy. But I, I deal with more how the spacecraft like actually fly, like the stuff we fly right now. Can you repeat the latter one? I didn't understand it. No. <laughs> Here's a thought: make a steam engine where the heat source is your CPU playing cities. <laughs> What's the chances of it coming back to Earth? The Tesla? No. No, that's the chances. No. <laughs> All right. Would it rust in space? You need oxygen to do that, Phantom. For stuff to oxidize or rust, you need oxygen. There's not a lot of that up in space. What is up there are, uh, well, stars, particularly one that's a lot closer than any other ones. And the thing about it is that, yeah, um, it melts things. Yeah. Yeah. Ever, uh, been to or live in a place where it's sunny a lot, like California, Texas, Florida. Yeah, the sun burns paint off of cars. Yeah, it does that only way, way, way faster up in space. <laughs> You're in the UK, you don't see the sun. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right, well, in places where there is sun, dude, yeah, it burns paint off of cars. <laughs> Um, the sun does that very well when you're up in space. Part of the reason why that happens is because you're in a vacuum. There's no way to convect heat. There's no way to conduct heat. There's no way to, well, there is a way to radiate heat, but last time I checked, the Tesla Roadster has a radiator on it that's designed to cool the electric motors, not cool the entire car. So what's most likely happened to the Roadster is that it, it, uh, it's melted. Yeah, it's melted. It's probably unrecognizable at this point. The sun do be like that. You suppose the batteries exploded? There weren't any batteries on board Hellfish. No, Splaw. Yeah, something like that, Tessa. Is it still being tracked? Nope. We know it's last known position, Jack, when the second stage it was attached to uh, last transmitted its position, but that was about six hours after launch. Nope. I have no idea where it is. How does heat travel through a vacuum? It doesn't. Well, 
It does. Black body radiation is what it's called. So it does, but it's 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 light. Yeah. That's how spacecraft keep cool. They use infrared. They they use light to cool stuff because light is up there. Photons, yeah, if you want to yeah, if you want to put it another way. Maybe help this, yeah. Yeah, now, yeah, I mean, living, if you want to put it in plain English, NASA, like on the ISS, the ISS has huge, gigantic radiator panels on it that are next to the big solar panels. Those radiator, pan those radiator panels use infrared. They use light to cool stuff. That's, that's not exactly right, but that's a plain English way of saying it. It's called black body radiation. Yeah. Because you're right, there's no air to keep it cool up there. You can't convect anything, and you definitely can't conduct something because you're, that would mean your space station is touching something else, which that's probably not a good thing. Um, so what's left if you can't convect or conduct? Radiation. So you use what you have to your advantage. That's how, if you don't do something like that, your, your mass spacecraft will absorb too much heat and will melt from the inside out. Dumb question. How do we know the current D-Stack is not for flight termination system arming? We don't. At least the space station doesn't have to deal with cold weather like snow. Well, what about when it goes to... when? Yes, it would suck if it would snow at the ISS. I'm just going to leave it at that. It's space-related. It counts. <laughs> nice, selfish. It sometimes snows there when the when there's cooling. Leak. Okay, all right. All right, I'll keep you guys posted on Starship information, but uh, as best as I can. But we'll switch over to cities now, and we'll go from there, okay? Let's make that push. 